<laughs> I was just about to start singing um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash to. Let's see if that person that I was about to sing to would know what who they are. Please, please don't, please don't, Amy. Uh, you put it's these it's gonna happen though. It's gonna come out. It's gonna happen. <gasps> Guinevere. <laughs> <I see. laughs> All right. Golden our eyes or hair. Like yours, lady, like yours. Here we go. Wow. Lots of folks. Yeah. Oh, and Julia Rose is here with a fancy new haircut. Hi, Julia Rose. <laughs> Alice Soa is here coming in from Iceland, doing some bacteria dying. Ooh, cool. Yeah. She was our picture of the week this week in our newsletter. Oh, that was very interesting. Yes. Very interesting. Everything I, I wanted to ask a quick question about Vivianite. To me? Yeah, to you. Yeah. yeah. Just, just a, a chat yeah. question, no, nothing intense. But like I saw a picture, uh, I think it was Scott who was holding like, it looked like a pine cone yeah. that was filled with Vivianite. Is that like a fossilized pine cone that had blue in it? Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, Scott, Scott. Um has a place that a tsunami came over the spruce trees and they got buried in the mud and those cones um, turned into Vivianite underwater, under mud and underwater. And then when you break them open, it's like bright blue eyes that are, I know. yeah, sometimes they're different and sometimes they're green inside. Sometimes they're even a little bit, they're not often white, like pure Vivianite when you find it fresh, but mm -hmm. sometimes they'll be baby blue. It's really cool. It's amazing. This tsunami was like thousands of years ago, right? Not, not too. I think it was just two thousand years ago. Not too. Oh, just two thousand years ago. Yeah, <laughs> in the deep time spectrum, not very far away. <laughs> I, a couple of days ago. ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just that I know. I'm like do do do. Two thousand is kind of a big number, but okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Give it another minute, Kathy, because there's still. You still, yeah, we still have a lot of people coming in. This is yeah. good. Heidi, Heidi pulls in a crowd. <laughs> Heidi is not me. It's the rocks. I don't do anything. It's all about the rocks. Yeah, <laughs> it's all about the book of Earth. <laughs> oh yeah, the book of Earth. It's a really Aww. good book. Aww. Wait, there we go. Oh, you've got yours up there. Yes, yeah, so that's why I was saying I don't want it to fall on me. Yeah. <laughs> I am so happy to see there's lots of faces here I haven't seen in a long time. I'm admitting oh, people. Oh, who's got people. that? Kate's got one. Yay. <laughs> cool. Thanks for coming here today, you guys. <sighs> All right, we could probably kick it off. All right, Amy. Kathy, you, you're going to let people in? I will let people in and you will count us in. I am not messing up the song today. Like, I'm just not. I'm not. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where have you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday. So come on in. Come sit down. Stare at your screen. We gotta present it that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, feedback, feedback Friday. Thank you, thank you, Amy. Thank you for the great song, the little dancing, all that. Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Feedback Friday, episode 122. Whoa. Feedback Friday is our show where we speak with dyers, 
artists, scientists, writers, scholars, historians, activists, uh, all sorts of folks about our favorite topic, which is natural dyeing and color. I'm Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors. And joining me from Cape Cod is Amy Dufo, director of communications. And today we are really excited to welcome one of our favorite people, Heidi Gustafson. Oh. Heidi is based in the Cascade foothills, so she's technically in both temporal and physical uh, time and location close to us here in Seattle. And um, she's in rural Washington, closer to the Canadian border, but she's still in our state. And Heidi's work is based on collaborative ochre and iron research and doing projects that work with scientists, anthropologists, linguists, linguists, indigenous practitioners, citizen foragers, healers, artists, and places around the planet. Heidi's current projects focus on ochre, iron oxide, and land pigments, and her cabin slash studio houses the ochre sanctuary. Um, this is an incredible collection that she holds to hold counsel uh, and give her information about things around the world. And it's a give and take uh, relationship that she has with all of these special um, pieces of land, mineral, and rocks. Um, she's also just written the most amazing, uh, beautiful book called The Book of Earth. Book of Earth. Amy's showing you too through stories, songs, poems, and images. And I have to tell you, I'm like swimming with the ancient gods and creatures who transformed iron rich dirt into their own bodies and where blood and ochre circulate within and among all things. I mean, this is an extraordinary journey. I was just kind of reading it like, yeah, yeah, ochres. I like ochres and also as this, it was sort of like something just pulled you in. And there you were, and it was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> so if you um, are interested in this book, you ought to get your, yourself a, a copy of it because it's really, really super um, amazing experience to read it. Um, let's see. So just a little housekeeping. Amy's going to be the moderator on um, the chat and also let people into the um, Zoom meeting. And we'd like to make sure that you're muted during Heidi's presentation and we'll open it up afterwards. Questions will be in chat. So Amy will open chat when it's time so you can post your questions there. And oh, I forgot to tell you that we're selling the Book of Earth, but I mean, just get yourself a copy. It's so incredible. And we're also having a flash sale this weekend. Um, we have a few other books that are on sale as well as um, some of our natural dye inks. So if you're interested, head over to the site and have a look at that. And I am going to now turn it over. Oh, we're going to have a video recording of this and then you'll be able to watch it afterwards and we'll send you, uh, there'll be the link access will be on our website. And now I'm just going to have Heidi um, take us on this magical journey. Welcome Heidi and thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that I get to be here with you and I'm going to share my screen so we can play with some pictures. Yay. Everybody see that okay? Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, anyways, thanks for being here, everybody. And I'm going to, my plan, I think, was just to sort of give everybody a quick whirlwind tour of the book, what's inside of it, what's in the chapters, and then maybe we can I imagine that some people in the audience have read pieces of it. Some people have no idea what it's about. And I figured we could spend a lot of time in Q&A just exploring what's actually important for people. That's my plan. But yeah, I wrote um, Book of Earth. And it says it's a guide to ochre pigment and raw color. But I might say it's not really a guide to ochre pigment and raw color. It's a little bit um, more magic mythic storytelling than it is a, a global expansive fact trotting way to use ochres. I think there's a lot of demonstrations of how to use ochres within it, which I'll get into, but it, I just want to, it's not, the book is not for everybody. So if you want a book that's like, here's how you use ochres, here's how to find them, here's exactly the, the protocols you need to have, and here's how you make them into 
natural dyes. Um, there's going to be other better books for you out there, but this one's really just my, I guess my spiritual offering, maybe more than a practical offering, if that makes sense. And I wanted to just give everybody here a little background into what came before this book. Like I wrote this book to translate the voices of rocks and to sort of give ochres their own voice. But in my mind, originally the book was just page after page of different ochres from different places. And they sort of spoke for themselves. And that was sort of the root inspiration for this book was how to get the ochres to come across as their own qualities and feelings so that you could maybe see them more in the land or relate to them more in their stories. And this is just my book that's all soils from the Cascadia region where I live, where Kathy and I live. And it's just an example of what the book could have been if I had let it be its sort of raw state. These, this a Vivianite on the one side and a, a green earth that's right off of a river down in Oregon. And so that influenced a lot of the photographs in the book. So this book has got so many land photographs and I wanna give a quick shout out to Brian Miriam, who's one of my photographers. He's got this incredible eye for land and being able to see it. And I feel like there's a lot of photos in the book where you have no idea what scale you're at and where you are in the world. And part that's part of the kind of lure, like you were saying, is like, whoa, what where am I? What's happening? And yeah, this, so these are all ochre rich landscapes from different places. And this is just the quick layout of what, what's actually in the book. So there's a beginning section where I touch quickly on the history of ochre, the meaning of ochre. I try to give some complex definitions of what ochre is for me personally, but also for other people in different fields, because ochre has about a thousand different meanings. And I explore them all and then kind of give my own, really based on the relationship between iron, ochre, and the planet Earth, and really bringing, tying that together as a main direction that the book is going. And you can see that the chapters are just by ochre. So this book is only about the earth pigments that we call ochre that I consider to be in the ochre family. And that's biogenic ochre, red ochre, yellow ochre, green earth, blue ochre, black ochre, and white earths, which are like the calcium carbonates of the world. And that's it. I don't know how this the publisher let me do this, but there's no, there's nothing else but earth pigments and ochres in here. And then I have a third section that's maybe something this audience would be a little bit more excited about than some, where it's, it gives some seed processes of how to work with ochre. It gives some seed recipes, some kind of archetypal recipes where that you can grow based on where you are, or you can adapt to your own cultural context. And then some binder like lists that are really detailed and, but not um, how to process them. They're more like inspirational lists. So you can be like, oh, you can mix ochre with the spit of a dog and, you know, things like that. Um, so this is that introduction moment. And again, I really think of ochres as having a huge diversity of minerals, not just the earthy hematites or iron oxides that are yellow and brown and red. And I include ochres that are blue and purple and green and have these a wide variety of colors that iron helps to produce. Um, and I open the book with this is, I think, Kathy and Amy, one of your more favorite moments is this story about the history of vultures relating to ochre and also toxic mine drainage that some of our friends like John Sabra and Onya McClausland that they work with um, in their in the local toxic coal mine drainage to help remediate it. So I kind of draw these two worlds together, which is a story that's in the book, so I'm not going to tell it now. But um, the vultures, I have found that they're incredible. To me personally, they've been educators of how to relate to ochres, they bathe themselves in the ochres and it becomes kind of an anti-bacterial uh, part of their life. It's really essential for how they communicate with one another. It helps to help keep smell down of all the rotten dead bodies that they're eating. And it gives you this sense that like we learned a lot about how to relate to ochre and it's multidisciplinary uses from vultures. And um, yeah, so I open up with this 
more than human teacher about ochres. Here's another beautiful photograph from John Sabra's friend, Ben, uh, in Ohio. And then we get into the red ochres, and I just wanted to give you a flavor of what sort of is how I set the structure of the book is. Every chapter has these trays with different variety of minerals that create a red pigment to really show the mineralogical diversity, but also the textural diversity and the incredible nuances that are within what we might just say is a red pigment, right? And this is a part of the story that's in the book about the island of Hormuz and its powerful red ochre history that's 500 million years old. And then every chapter has like, I'm interested in the relationship between the science part of it, the chemistry of it and the poetry. So I give everyone the definitions of ochre in terms of its technical term, like iron oxyhydroxides, but also the language part, the etymology where in this case, gertite, which is the mineral that forms yellow ochre means godfather. It comes, the root of the word means godfather. And there's all these stories about yellow ochre that relate to that as a, a mythic paradigm that yellow ochre relates to the godfather of our culture. So I'm following this kind of cultural language thread throughout the book, but also trying to draw in some of the scientific relevance. So if you wanted to look up more about gertite, you could do it through either the word yellow ochre, through the word gertite, or through the word iron hydroxide, or its chemical formula, or its poetry. Um, and that's really crucial for me. And then in every chapter, I also show the pigment spectrum that it's not a, a co comprehensive pigment spectrum, but it gives you a flavor of the diversity again of what you can, how you can experience a yellow ochre in its mineral form and in its color form. And I give some of the names, I give the chromas, I give the habitats that you can find it in. So I really treat the ochres like beings, like you would, or even like a little bit more like a mushroom guide where you're sort of following the different habitats where they form rather than just technically you go to the uh, store and get them at this particular place, um, but really focusing on the nuanced habitats of the kinds of rivers that they prefer or the quality of the bogs that they also prefer to grow in and to be formed in. And this is another example of the many different kinds of gertite. I love these. It's also a hard story in the book where I go really deep into the Euro-American history of mining iron from bogs in the colonial origin story of America. And it's, um, yeah, this one means a lot to me. So we can get into that maybe in the Q and A, but I also show the paint swatches for every pigment. So it kind of goes from mineral to pigment to paint or to, this is really just pigment mixed with water. There's no binder in any of these. And they kind of describe in poetic terms where the material is from. So you get a real place-based understanding of these materials imagistic understanding, a real like vibrant sense of what it feels like in the land when you're actually working in a place that has a lot of this particular ochre in it. This is the story I was telling you about. Every chapter has, yeah, a mythic geology story that kind of brings you really into the core, of, like soul of the material of the ochre, in my opinion. Um, and then I get in, I get these little moments uh, note moments where I kind of, it's almost like sharing a little bit of my diary or like my field diary when I've been out gathering ochres, it's not what it might feel like if I'm looking for a particular quality. And I, I just try to convey them in the sense that I've written them down in my journal. So it feels much more intimate and personal. And these are sort of, if you actually want to learn how to gather ochre, these are the moments in the book where I'm kind of doing teaching about how to gather appropriately and thoughtfully. Green earth, then we get into that. And this is in this green earth chapter, I tell one of my absolutely favorite stories, which is in collaboration with my friend who's a soil scientist for the Department of Energy. And he um, 
helps to engineer soils that cover nuclear waste depositional cells. So where all nuclear waste goes, he's the one who helps uh, understand how the soils work. And a big component of that is green earths. And this photograph in the book is really unique. I was so excited to have this in the book, which is literally like if you were to cut, um, cut down into a soil infrastructure that's holding down nuclear waste, this is what it looks like. And it's this incredible, beautiful, to me, painting, photograph, quality of just how the earth is trying to keep a toxic energy buried and the, the quality of the ochres that are doing that work. Um, and I get into the story of how that works as a um, more, instead of looking at it in terms of color, it's really looking at it in terms of functionality, like what the ochre is doing to help keep nuclear waste underground. And they get to blue ochre, which is every, everyone loves a Vivianite, and we can talk about that. And I, I chose to tell a couple stories about um, finding Vivianite when it's in that raw white state, but also in a place where there's some tragedy that occurs. And Vivianite is often found in places of the dead and it's found in traumatics, what we might consider traumatic landscapes where um, like a tsunami, like we mentioned at the beginning where a tsunami might've come and destroyed an entire ecosystem. And Vivianite is sort of what remains as this life force memory of the dead or of this being. And so I kind of help people dive into that um, magic and mystery. And not just in the places where there has been some traumatic death of a person, but also in our wastewater industries. Vivianite is, this is one of my favorite photographs from Des Moines, Iowa of their just, they have one of the largest wastewater plants in the country that processes pharmaceutical waste, pig waste, lots and lots of pigs, um, lots of animals, lots of corn feed, you know, just everything you can think of. And this is the Vivianite that gets formed in it that's trying to hold on to the life force that's sort of getting flushed through these pipes and back out into the water system. And then I get into the last, some of the last chapters are these other ochres that don't get talked about so much, but this is magnetite um, in, that's mined in one of the biggest iron mines in Russia. And it's sort of like the story of how we're mining out the head of the earth and the relationship between how we have magnetite in our brains and also earth has all this magnetite in what I consider the top. I mean, obviously that's the earth is every directional, but it's this, yeah, the story of like what it would feel like to have your, this magnetite in your brain taken out and distributed all over the planet. Um, really trying to use ochre to also help understand how to empathize with what earth is going through right now in climate change and in the sixth mass extinction and just really watching how ochres are teachers about how we relate to the earth. And the last one is um, white earths, which include marble, limestone, shells, bones, the, all the things that end up getting compressed. And this is a beautiful photograph from Marta Abbott, who's a wonderful pigment maker as well. Um, yeah, and then this is the little section that I think a lot of people get drawn to, which is how to, once you hear a lot of these stories, culturally specific stories, then I kind of guide you into what does it feel like to actually work with a piece of the heart of the earth or the the skin of the earth, the flesh of the earth, and process that into um, pigment and then into many other material, all of our creative materials, the dyes, the paints, the medicines. Um, so we go through some of the binders. And this is one, I put this one up here because I don't think there's no way to know this in the book, but since we're in a special space here, um, this is a list of a lot of binders that you can use from peep, from animals and from biological beings that um, offer parts of themselves to us to use. And I took this photograph of a dead, I think it's a rabbit, but this is at the temple of Hephaestus, who's the god of iron in Greece um, on the island of Lemnos. And it was just this, for me, a moment of being like, secretly I'm gonna put in a binder that a picture of a binder animal 
that's from the temple of the iron god in my culture that just is laying on the ground kind of it just meant symbolically it meant a lot to me but it's there's no way to know that that's Hephaestus's temple um and then yeah so these I explore a few of the recipes that maybe you can make lipstick there's one there's one where I talk about how to use wheat paste to make for lime, like not lime washes, but for making plas natural plaster paint. And I talk about how to make some natural crayons and all kinds of things, but nothing that's high technical. So it's kind of giving you a window into where to then further explore and maybe do a lot of your own research or hang out with Kathy and Amy more. <laughs> yeah. Um, then that's kind of just the, the sprouts I wanted to send out. That's the whole book. And I figured maybe Amy and Kathy, if you, you've you had a, a touchdown into some of the deeper chapters, I could get into one of those stories or not, or we could just dig in with what people wanna explore in terms of the the more, um, yeah, the, the deeper themes. I just wanted to give this surface overlay. Does that feel good? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there's only a couple questions in there right now besides people are just, saying how much they love it and it's beautiful and amazing and the presentations but one of the things when we were talking yesterday about some of the things that have jumped out at me like I don't know the, the exact line but you were we were talking about how in each one of us there's this landscape these different landscapes and there could be these ancient landscapes or it could be the fires right now from other landscapes that are coming here to Cape Cod but but just maybe talk about that part of your book where you talk about the landscapes within us. Yeah, I think um, I draw on this Italian artist who I love, um, who works with natural pigments. And he said something akin to, maybe I can just read it. I have the book here. Um, he said, there are landscapes that have long been digested, which live inside of you. And that's a really big theme throughout the book is just thinking about how our bodies are made of earth and how the places that we are from and the places that we have connection to influence um, how we think and feel and who we are. And I, I feel like a lot of the book is also trying to, almost like if you could eat this book and let it digest really slowly, it would probably be more informative than trying to read it chapter by chapter. It's meant to, you know, do something. The ochres do something to our bodies, whether or not we're touching them or not. They, I feel like they're, you can kind of look at each of these, like in this photograph, for example, you can look at each of these and experience them as a color, but you also kind of get a, a mood and a feeling and a, a sense that there is a placeness to them, or that's the goal of the book is to really open up that there's lands, yeah, there's landscapes inside of every color, but there's also land um stories and people and history and deep time magic that's also held within that and then also in in us like a, a lot of it is for me how do we um how do we bring closer together the fact that we are as much rock as anything else that our bones our mineral work built on a mineral infrastructure our our blood is built on a mineral infrastructure. We have rocks in our heads. We have a just, we're like the children of earth. And I think it's important to honor, if, as, if we can't honor the rocks in front of us, how can we honor the earth inside of us, right? Something like that. Yeah. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. And so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kathy, um, did you have something from the book? You know, I only, I, I think one of the things that you're talking about, Heidi, that I think is, it was interesting for me was that there's so much, there's so much that helps me shift understanding and even awareness in terms of, you know, I'm pretty normal where I'm often looking for things that might make color that's plant-based, but I don't often look for things that might make color that are earth-based and the earth-based mm -hmm. palette um, is equally compelling. And it just feels like it has this immense story that I, I don't even know how to ask yet. 
right? So I'm looking at your book as kind of a way to begin that that conversation. But the other thing I thought was because I am personally so alarmed about climate change, I just had this moment when I was reading the book where I realized, okay, it, it, we may not be there, but the earth is still going to be there and the earth is still going to have all of this. Mm. So y- stop feeling so threatened and start thinking about like how you're going to transform into what this earth will be. And mm. that was that was an interesting kind of shift for me because um, I'm reading way too much newspaper and climate info and it's, you know, it's scary, but um, that that really helped me a lot. Mm. Yeah, I think I've learned a lot from the Oakers about that, that balance of trusting that you're going to re-sediment into the earth, but also really fighting for the rituals that allow us to re-sediment into the earth, which we don't really have in our, well, at least in your American culture, we don't have a great process of re-entering the bloodstream of the earth that is celebrated. And I think the ochres know a lot about that because they've been used in by humans for 500,000 years in not just leaving a mark behind rituals, but in burial rituals. And so if you can think about them as being the teachers of how to lay, like paint, paint the human as it needs to get redigested into the earth or kind of give this process, which we are scared about, this mass death process that we are in the middle of, um, a little bit more tangibility, a little bit more potential even beauty, like honoring that this isn't, doesn't have to be a apocalyptic moment. That's just a myth. That's part of a dominant myth in our culture about how we experience scary stuff um but it can also be we can switch that around and hold carry the beautiful parts of that carry the ritualistic parts of that and the um yeah I think the ogres teach a lot a lot about that that was that was transform transformative for me because it just moved the fear to out and then the possibility became open you know yeah that was great I love that and I feel like the ogres I've learned a lot about um, how to open up more of that space in my heart too from them and just also having them around in the studio, all different ones, sort of like you were in the beginning saying that I hold counsel with them and just watching them talk, like not, I wouldn't say they're talking to each other, but they're definitely exchanging and you can see that they're sort of have this agenda to be like, okay, how do we get the humans to like calm down and, and, you know, get like we all do, like trying to get a little more patient with the earth, a little more careful, a little more steward, like stewarded into the next generations in a way that uh, keeps all the magic that's in it and all the beauty that's here and and the power, creative power. Yeah. All right, Uh, Amy, I am gonna, if there's questions. There's there's definitely questions. There's questions, comments, whatever. Questions, specific questions. I'm just gonna start at the top with questions and do you want me to um unshare my screen sure. or just... yes we can just see you sure. okay so here's one well how about i'm going to cut it in half and maybe you can talk more about that story about mining ochres in bogs okay mining ochre in bogs yeah well she's yeah. please do say more about the euro-american colonial story of mining ochres in bogs curiosity is peaked (laughs) yeah so um so the story in the book is called shadow ore and it's really looking in particular how um during early colonial settlements on the east coast they were trying to find places where that was rich in iron rich in water and rich in forests specifically to be able to smelt um, ochre into iron because in order to have a colonial agenda, you have to have guns, steel, um, chains, armor, nails to build your, you know, all of that relies on local native iron, not native in the, the just native as in local. And so the place where the most um, ochres are, are in bogs, like these girtite or, or, ores form in a bog environment because of the um, these microbes that 
connect to the iron in the water, they process it through their bodies and then they put out ochre and then that ochre slowly hardens into minerals. And that mineral is rich, rich in iron. So the colonists would try to like take over places where they had all these bog iron ore. And it, there's all kinds of stories about why they did that. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was that um, at the time when this is happening, when in our history of our country, this is the exact same time when over in England, which has run out of iron and run out of fuel, that's why they're coming over. Um, that's when Newton is like describing color as being a property of light and it has nothing to do with matter anymore. And so there's this, to me, there was this really interesting parallel between all of a sudden color is a property that can be owned I ochre becomes iron that can be the stuff of the colonial agenda. And at this also the word landscape at that same time gets adopted into the English. So land becomes a picture. So everything kind of starts to get this further layers of abstraction um, built on taking over these bog places. And what, I mean, we can get more into this, but what's interesting about it is that there's in the bogs, the ochre actually can regrow. So it can be harvested and then it can regenerate. And most people don't realize that rocks can regenerate in a, an environment like that, but they only regenerate. It's a lot like mushroom foraging. It's a lot like medicine plant foraging or any other plant foraging or food, wild food foraging or any of these things. There's a, a limit to how many you can gather before they do not regrow. So this is the biggest issue we see is that a lot of these bogs were overmined and they're not able to bring back this really important iron mineral that then feeds the microbes and it feeds the local community of plants and becomes this nutrient. So I was just exploring that story in that chapter um, that's pretty untold in a lot of other histories because it's like unless you follow the material history of ochre you don't really see this larger story of iron, the weaponization of iron bogs in our culture. If that makes sense, like that's just a little taste of that. It's like these things that you just never think about. I just, I put in the chat, Moira, Moira Bateman was a Feedback Friday presenter. She's from Minnesota and she's doing a lot of beautiful artwork using bogs, yeah. like the bog, kind of just leaving fabrics inside bogs and, and going into these pristine lakes and stuff too. But interesting Feedback Friday with, with uh, Moira when she was talking about that. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I missed that one, but that's exactly, I would love just, yeah. Yeah, she's working a lot with water, just like the idea of water and, and future and stuff too. So it's a, it's a good one, check it out. Okay, uh, Heidi, how do you define ochre? Oh yeah, <laughs> well, that's a, a tricky one, but um, I think the superficial definition that I use, like the surface material one is that it's an iron, any, any mineral that has iron and oxygen together, um, also with land. And there's lots of minerals that are like that. And then on the deeper surface, the deeper layer of that, I define ochres as um, material, like pieces of the earth that are portals to the heart of the earth, because the heart of the earth is also an iron, an oxygen. It actually, they just discovered this last year that it's an iron oxide too. It's literally an ochre. It's not just pure iron, which they used to think. It actually is a very complex iron oxide. And so you can think about the core of the earth as being a whole like uh, being ochre that then we're sort of on the outside of gathering the little portals that go into the part of the earth. So there's both of those to me that a kind of spiritual definition and a material definition. That's the basic. And they also, of course, ochres make, if you crush them, they make a huge variety of these pigments and mm -hmm. uh, textures and qualities and they, they're high staining usually. Yeah, there was something I just saw on the news and it's gonna be, this is so something I saw on the news, <laughs> but it was it was um, actual, like these cores that they, that they just got of the earth. I don't know if you saw something about that. It was like these big, long, I don't know, like crazy cores of the earth, but um they look know, like? what's that what did they look like did you were they were they did they show photographs of them 
it just looked like this kind of almost like magma colored, but all the way, yeah, just like just core samples. So they're just it's like the length of a ship because I or anyways, I'm gonna find it, I'm gonna send it to you, but I was wondering if you did see it. Oh, I'm gonna make a note. I'm, I'll go look it up. That sounds I just love it's amazing the layers of earth once we when you use an auger like that, which is what I yeah. think they're called big drills that pull out the whole soil core and you're yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. I love that somebody just called you a rock star. <laughs> okay. Um, so somebody's wondering what led you to, to have this focus. Mm -hmm. it, the ochres, I think, really led me to it, to them through both, like, I I was led to them through a meditation space at first, kind of the inside. I, I did a meditation once and I kind of met an ochre being who said, you got to work with us. You got to work with ochres. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And then I had a dream of an ochre place that was also similarly like compelling, but I was like, I don't think that's real. And then it turns out that that place was real. And I walked that place and I found the ochres in this actual, actual place in the world. And then turns out as I worked more with this inner spiritual guide, you could say, the more I was able to see ochre in the, on the earth and in the surface of the earth. So um, to me, the ochres kind of came from inside out or kind of from my unconscious up to my consciousness or from my, like an imaginal place into a, the earth place. And I always think that's sort of appropriate in a way, since ochres are such a powerful keeper of the imagination, they really help us to communicate and to express ourselves and to have all these creative capacities through their diverse function, color, and all kinds of connection to the earth. So it's, I think some people might think that's a little bit woo woo, but I'm always, I'm just sort of like, it seems very logical, like that we, that ochre came from inside out for me as opposed to outside in. Yeah. I think there's a lot of other things in the world that seem way more woo woo than that. Like I, <laughs> I'm going to go with, I believe that. And I'm just glad that those, those beings spoke to you and that you're here and you wrote this book and you do all the great work that you do. And um, anyway, okay. So, okay. Is green earth something that exists naturally or is it specifically created for toxic waste containment? Yeah, it's not, it's natural. Um, and actually what's interesting about the story that I tell in the book is that before uranium is extracted from its natural habitats, um, you will often find it with green ochre all binding on top of it. Almost like if you were to, if you were to know what you were looking at, you would be like, oh, the uranium in the cliff face is being held by the green earth naturally. So maybe that means that the if you know something about green earth that it's trying to keep it bound and you should not extract it but then you know uranium got extracted anyways and then now 100 100 years later they're like oh no we have to figure out how to re-sediment it rebury it for ever for a million years and they're like what do we use oh the native green earth that it was with from time immemorial duh and so there's just yeah it's very natural and it can also of of course be engineered but mostly it's it's a um, the clay structure of it has to be from a, a natural environment for it to function or from a in situ place that's already existing kind of going along the same theme here um anya is asking i'm so curious to hear more about the interface between nuclear waste pollution and soil pigments i did not realize that pigments can be produced in our living response to what's happening in the landscape, such as the blue pigment built up in that urban water treatment plant. Can you illuminate this more, please? Yeah, I think um, that's actually something really important to me to, that I'm still learning about all these ways where the earth is trying to tell us, hey, look how I am remediating myself uh, from you people. Look at what I'm doing to try to be self-healing to be um, self-regenerative and to do that specifically in places where the human hubris often or like the human uh, growth problem has it needed to be, it is the problem. And so I've, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like taking, I don't know how to put it. It's like re reversing 
the idea of what it means to paint or to make a mark. It's almost like watching the earth leave the, the earth's mark behind as a signal to be like, oh, this is where we need to kind of erase our mark. So if that makes sense, like I feel like the earth is leaving these colorful spots to be like, here's what I'm doing. Look how I'm burying this. Look how I'm carrying this. And this is where you need to draw back your marks. Like, let me make the marks. You all need to put your hands like on yourself, right? In your so, pocket. Yeah, I, 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 I know that's a little abstract, but that's sort of the, my tone, the tone that I have witnessed or that I, that I experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you use any of these pigments on interior walls, not plaster in homes as wall paint? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the ochres are, if today, like in contemporary paint, iron oxide is the, one of the main colorants for all paint, the interior paints. Um, but it also is something you can just rub directly on the wall without a binder and it will stain it. And, um, yeah, you can mix it with wheat paste. You can mix it with milk paint is a really popular one for paint, natural paints on the inside interior of a house. Um, in lots of places, it's mixed directly with the material that's being built, used to build the house. So mud and straw for adobe, it, the pigments are mixed right in. There's all kinds of ways that it can be used um, inside. And it is like it's in, it's in all of our house paints. Oh. Yeah. Everybody's minds are like, women. what, what? <laughs> it's also um, in all of our cosmetics, which is interesting. It's like, it hasn't, for 500,000 years, we've been using ochres in our interior spaces, but also on our bodies. And that's still exactly where you find it today, mm -hmm. even if it's in a syn synthetic version, which of course, synthetic pigments still come from the earth. We know <laughs> like, it's not, that's not a not earth material. That's still an earth material. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, uh, somebody's asking, what is the name of that? What's the name of the Italian artist? We're well, talking about landscapes that live inside us. You um, read. Carlos Romiti, Romiti, R-O-M-I-T-I -I is his last name. Okay. Yeah, I think A you have some videos online. That's my, and yeah, you can look them up. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Noted. Okay. Uh, a photo showed a sea. Oh my God. It's like a tongue twister. A photo showed a seashell muscle, a muscle with a deep bluish color. Could you talk more about that? Yeah. That in that last photo, um, that was actually a gift from my friend who made it out of charcoal from the plant from her land and put it in the muscle shell. So it was just a container in that case for her. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. What would you use on fabric? I think it meant to glue the the pigment on, but they were to glue the pigment on. Is there some? <laughs> is there? Is that? It's to glue it, right? To, to glue. I mean, I, glue? Tell that me is the you, question. Tell me if you would agree, but um, as far as I know, the soy the soy binders are the the best ones for the ogre family and the strongest help helper to bind with. Most fab, most textile, right? Kathy, maybe you can speak to that a little bit more since that's not my expertise. Um, sure. So um, any medium that, so it depends on if you want something that you're gonna be wearing versus something that's going to be an art piece that just happens to be on a textile, fabric, canvas, whatever. But I mean, you can use any, when I'm saying medium, I'm saying things like, you know, as, as common as an acrylic medium that you get from the local art store, all the way to creating um, a soy milk base. You can use casein, you can use a tempera um, for naturals. You can use any type of gums that um, we would normally use in, in artwork, such as gum Arabic. Um, I suppose guar gum works too. As long as it's not gonna be re- wet you know like you're not going to wash it if you're doing any type of washing um i would say soy is probably the most accessible but pigments because they're not water soluble and they won't bond the way that a, a, a dye stuff would you're always going to have it's always going to be um attached 
in a different manner that would also, if you're washing all the time, you may start to see some color change and color loss. But the the ochre palette is so beautiful, you know, you just kind of have to go, okay, <laughs> I'll only wash this once a year and it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, and it's kind of cool to think that the ochres already have a little bit of that antibacterial properties in them. So it maybe helps keep the, the garment cleaner longer too. I always just rub, I literally just will have, if I haven't, I've been working with a pigment in my mortar and pestle and it looks really high staining and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a pain to wash out of my mortar. I'll just put like a piece of clothing that I wanna dye in it and really rub it hard with water and just leave it there in the sunshine for a week and then get it all rubbed in and it, well, it washes out, but then it really stains very lightly. So it's kind of cool that you don't even have, you can just waterize it. it it's definitely a, a way to experiment to see like, what are the qualities of this substance and what's it gonna do? Um, I think a lot of times we really are trying so hard to make it do what we want it to do, but it's gonna do what it's gonna do. Um, and that's, I think the point of, many of the stories that you tell is that there is an entire um, conversation about what it is and what it's gonna show us. And we should be watching and observing and trying to learn rather than trying to like shoehorn it into something that we think it ought to do. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. It's like, instead of controlling the medium, letting the medium have an influence on you, yeah. Uh, there's so many artists that are embracing that, and I just feel like their work is is compelling um, because yeah, of that. I feel like I learn a lot, too, from watching other people listening to the material they feel really drawn to, especially when it's not something that I relate to so strongly. Just like any relationship, I'm like, wow, you know a lot about mugwort and like how to work with mugwort and just watching that process. So mm -hmm. inspiring to me, just mm -hmm. all the ways people have their language earth language I guess exactly right? earth language I love that yeah <laughs> all right let's see um so what are some guidelines for forging ochre sustainably is there a certain process that is I ideal and a certain amount that's appropriate to harvest yeah this is a complicated very rich dialogue we could have um I think the first thing is like ochres are not sustainable. I mentioned that bog irons regrow, but otherwise we're working with non-renewable minerals that once they're taken from a place that they're formed, they don't reform there in that place most, most of the time. Um, not to say they're not dynamic, but there's that factor. So if you are extra, you know, you might not know that the place that you're in is a 3 billion year old iron that's made by microbes that created the environment and the amount of respect that it takes to carry that rock is gonna feel really different than say, um, really fresh rust that you gather off of some, some steel railroad track or something. And I think that's the first thing is like, well, what is it when you're talking about freshing up a 3 billion year old story of the earth versus a little bit of rust from a nail like what's sustainable where like the question of what's sustainable becomes really confusing to me and it really becomes more about how do you create reciprocity with whatever place it is that you're working with and the people that are of that place that you're working with and what does it mean to have permission from the people who are the stewards of that place especially indigenous communities of a place and or how do you ask permission from the rock themselves if you may carry them or work with them or take them from their place. Cause anytime you're working with a mineral, you're if you're moving it, it's changing its relationship to you, but also to place. And so there's, it's, there's, there's so many layers to this question. There isn't really a, um, here's a sustainable way to work with rocks. And I think I explore, the book really explores kind of the nuances. So if you, if you go through it, there's, um, you know, I'll sh I kind of share different ways that I've experienced both the mistakes of trying to forage something or taking too much or take or not having um, the right relationship and having to return something to a place, not realizing that it had a, a powerful story or a powerful keeper. Um, I don't know, this could, we could go on and on about this question. Um, yeah, it's, it's complex. But also it's a heart center. Like, I think at the end of the day, kind of where sustainable also 
relies on like heartland like where do you does your heart feel good when you're doing like do you feel warm and like strong and and loving and care caring and caretaking when you're working or are you just like in a creative mania that you need a material to do something with right yeah yeah it's like the it's sustainability an interesting is thing to say yeah yeah it's such an interesting take i was we um two things i wanted to say one is that um the volcano kilauea is like having a massive eruption right now mm -hmm. and uh Amy and I were just there in April and it was only steaming. It wasn't really doing anything active, but it was still extremely powerful and magical. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picked up a few uh, lava pebbles there because I thought, oh, I should mail these to Heidi. <laughs> and then someone said to me, oh, you must never gather that, never. And so I had to like put them back. It's like, okay, bye. But yeah, there was a it was a really strong boundary about whether or not one could remove, you know, I didn't have any of the the relationship at all. Mm -hmm. I was a tourist. And um that that was pretty profound for me. Like, ah, you really have to kind of think about this. Mm -hmm. And before yeah. you start just kind of taking because you're there, you know, it's that Instagram thing that you, I'm here, I did it, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very different um, dynamic that's going on. Yeah. And I mean, those protocols are in place and they've been in place for so long for a reason, because they are real, like that you actually would have probably a negative affect if you had carried those with you. And it's, it's, you know, we don't know. I mean, what, what do we know about gods and mountains and goddesses? Like it's very, calm that we need to keep learning because they have a real, there's, there's real impact. We don't understand. Yep. Totally. Or not we, but like, me particularly as a Euro American. Me particular um, too. Yeah, yeah. Clueless. So yeah. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. different in every place because it's not the the these are really like you said, relationship to particular places mm -hmm. is how you learn how to have a have gathering protocols. It's these very each place it's like has one its of own. the most sacred places for um indigenous peoples on the island. And and you know, I was like, oh, I'll get some pebbles. <laughs> You're like, whoops. <laughs> but you have to learn that way. I mean, I think that's also, it's it's better to have learned it through your experience than have just re have not. Yeah, I think that you were trying to relate and that's what I love. That's what is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that is just a really good place to, to um, end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it kind of answers a couple other questions too, just about place and, and taking and that. So I feel like we should just leave it right there because that was a really good, be, be cautious, be careful, be, thought, be, be thoughtful. I mean, did anybody see the Brady Bunch when they went to Hawaii and the tarantula climbed up Greg's chest? Like you don't take anything from Hawaii. No, no. I didn't see the Brady. <laughs> <laughs> the mantras you can those mantras are real that's a good those are real no, <laughs> no, no i was i was definitely like that too with uh when kathy and i we were looking all shells and stones and usually when kathy and i are together our pockets are full like like a squirrel's cheeks you know we're like oh my god you know mm -hmm. but yeah, we, <laughs> just leave things alone and and respect where they are yep yeah, they have a, there's a joke I learned from someone once who had, who teaches a lot of archaeology classes out in the Southwest. And she was like, every time somebody goes down to like pick up a piece of something on the earth, I'll, she'll be like, oh, I'll, let me tell you what that mineral is. It's called leverite. And you're like, leverite? She's like, yeah, leverite there. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I always thought was funny. Uh, 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 that's funny. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. Yeah, thank thank you for having me. Thanks for if, if folks want to unmute and just have a chat with Heidi about yes. how to thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, thank you, Heidi. You. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Amy and Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Super thank inspiring. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Everyone, rock on. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I, I, I like your philosophy. Leave, leave with nothing but pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in some cases, you're not even allowed to take pictures. Oh, but you can keep them in your mind. Yes, yes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Your yeah. mind's the best camera anyway. Mm. Yeah. The quote, the quote of the day <laughs> is the best camera, Kathy Atori. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so nice all right you guys oh i like that somebody's just showing up right now to join us just let them in <laughs> just for the heck yeah, so i i'm sure we're going to sell out we've we've had to reorder Ka um kathy heidi's book like three times this is the third so, time yeah third yeah. reorder so get get your copy on our site we'll be reordering more i'm sure uh, we already have yeah okay so. good Hopefully we'll have enough, but you know, it's, it's such a treasure, this book. Yeah, it really is. Thank you for being here and doing all the work you both do and sharing. Oh, Heidi. Likewise. Look up Moira's work too. I love people that work with. Um, yeah. Moira's doing beautiful work. Um, and of course, I really think that there's like an opportunity between Heidi, Scott, and a few other people I know that would just be a super magical gathering. I meant to, I was too hot, but you know what I brought today to wear that I, that was too hot to wear? Um, my jacket by Cara. Oh, nice. oh. <laughs> It's dyed with um, iron, some iron rust and Beautiful. it's all patchwork and it has stains on it that she left on there because it's antique fabric. Anyways. Oh, I, right. No, hold on. I'm going to take a picture Cara. of you. Yeah. Hold on. Say something again so I can say that you're the main person. Here. Check it oh, yeah. out, Kara's jacket. So beautiful. All right, I got it. There's proof there. <laughs> All right, great. I know. Hi, Marie. <laughs> you did. You... Hi. Hi. Right. Heidi. Right. I just put it in chat. Moira's Feedback Friday. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording, everyone. Oh, yeah. Unless somebody want, has something really important to say.